Hey boys and girls, how's it going? Hang rats back on the 0360 A4K build. Uh, today we are going to be doing the intake tubes, dipstick tube, drain plugs, inner cylinder baffles, oil pressure, and uh, blah blah blah. Just a bunch of little things kind of finishing up this engine. So hang on, here we go. Okay, so this is the last episode in the engine build series for the 0360. First thing we're going to be doing is the oil relief valve. Pretty simple. Just a cast aluminum housing, a little cast aluminum housing. I typically like to paint these yellow so that you know it's the oil relief valve. Kind of make it stupid proof. The older Lycomings will have a, uh, an actually an adjustable oil relief valve. And this will allow you to set pressure through the life of the engine. On this, the later versions or later, later iterations, and when I say later, the last, well, I don't know, maybe 50 years, they, uh, they got rid of that probably because it cost a dollar or two more and uh, just have a spring and a ball. So that's what we're putting in that configuration. That's what came with the engine. I always put a, on overhaul, we always put a new spring in because we don't know what's happened to that spring, who's had their way with that spring. We'll double check. At overhaul, the seat of the relief valve area was gone through at the crankcase shop, so that's all been checked out. So we're putting that all, basically screwing that all together. Now, for a lot of you folks, you may not understand or realize the importance of this. Essentially, your oil pump makes too much oil all the time. So the oil pressure relief valve is continually working. It's not just every now and then, but it's continually working. That's the whole whole reason or the whole uh, premise of the oil lubrication system in your engine is you want the oil pump to overperform and then you will relieve it to your required pressure. So that is quite, quite important in the uh, operation of the engine. But yes, that is essentially working all the time. Sort of like a voltage regulator. And what I'm doing here is uh, I'm just hand, I hand tightened it. I put a big loose safety on it and that tells me, hey, come back later and tighten this up. I'll actually put a flag on that later. Baffles. What we do in the baffles is uh, we're going to use brand new baffles. Um, it, this, this is just the inner cylinder baffle. The old baffles uh, get a bunch of corrosion, a bunch of crap on them. Just kind of nasty all around. Chafed. Uh, they end up chafing into the steel cooling fins on the lower barrel. So we basically buy new baffles. The baffles really aren't that expensive. They're really uh, probably one of the best values going. Um, so we're putting new baffles in uh, inner cylinder. On a four cylinder, you're only looking at two. On a six cylinder, you're of course you're gonna have four. So it's pretty pretty easy deal to uh, accommodate in your budget. And especially with all the time money you put on the overhaul, it really does finish it out nice. Kind of make sure that everything's good. The amount of time you'd have to go and spend to regenerate your old baffles isn't really worth it. Um, it's really not worth it at all. So this is a good deal. What I'm doing now is I'm just making a kind of a safety wire handle, just a double loop of some 20,000 safety wire. Um, and uh, that will allow me to get hold of the S-hook and um, put the S-hook uh, in the hand in my hand with uh, holding pulling it with a screwdriver and then uh, allows me to lift that s hook up over the retaining strap the upper strap or retainer whatever you want to call it which i kind of give a little nudge you have to push it in so you're kind of working against the kind of a spring and a spring to a point so we get that on then we're going to make sure that kind of everything's in the right place uh, of course i have to cut off my handle and throw it out get it where it needs to be and always walk I always walk the safety wire over the trash can make sure it's not popping all over the place and then making sure everything is in the right lineup and all that because sometimes when you're when you're adjusting the uh, when you're installing it gets a little bit just a little bit off so you want to double check that that's good everything's looking good there then we're gonna go inspect the bottom and double check things like whoops that's not where it's supposed to be so we're going to lift that up again it's flexible it's got it basically has some spring tension we're just going to make sure that it's all engaged in the 
cooling fins and all that make sure everything's where it's supposed to be so looks like looks like a new penny looks pretty good so pretty pleased with that and then the other thing I'm doing here is I'm kind of counting fins to make sure that the fin count is uh, the same on left and right make sure those s hooks aren't at an angle and just making sure everything's right where it needs to be everything's lined up and uh, organized so nothing's crooked and the engine will have max cooling that's the biggest thing we want to do we want to make sure this thing has every 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 effort to keep it in operating great step great uh, great shape dipstick pretty simple <clears throat> um so we're cleaning off the base surface and all that now what i what i do on the on the dipstick is i will put the dipstick in i will use a permatex number two on the gasket only the threads are wetted the problem with the dipstick is student pilots or owners that don't know how to put a dipstick in a lake homing they'll crank down on the dipstick that transfers the torque of that tube down to the threads down at the bottom which are kind of a big sloppy thread and the dipstick loosens then you have oil leaks so what i try to tell students and pilots owners is if you're going to tighten your dipstick do it with one finger uh, to which they say well you can't tighten the dipstick exactly but on a lycoming that dipstick will not come loose it will not come out you will not have oil leaks because of the height of the top of the dipstick it actually acts as a crankcase breather you might get a little mist coming out but that's about it you're not going to ever have a leak you could probably almost assuming you didn't go inverted you could leave the dipstick out on a lycoming it would not be a leak problem for a multi-hour flight and here i am putting my flags on the safety wire for the dipstick and then also putting a flag on the one for the oil relief so that that's a reminder to me to come back and get those tightened up torqued and then safetyed and then we'll put the torque seal marking on them here are the drain back tubes on this particular one we um, I'm trying to remember because we did this this past summer so I'm trying to remember but of course all new rubber all new um, all new uh, clamps uh, hose clamps we call them hose clamps over in the British Empire you'd call those Jubilee clamps but the lower Jubilee clamps will all I, I put all new ones on and then uh, the tubes typically are in um, pretty good shape uh, I don't know if we bought new ones for this engine or not. Sometimes when you buy a new one, it's very, very close. But they're just 50-50-2-0 aluminum, and you might have to give them a little bit of a nudge to get them lined up exactly. Most importantly, before you tighten the lower hose clamps, tighten the B-nut on the cylinder. Make sure that's all lined up because it's harder to get that uh, aligned than it is to get your clamps aligned on the bottom so pretty much just nut driver now this is kind of important both this and i'll talk about it a little bit more on the intake pipes is have some pity on the next person that's maintaining this aircraft or whatnot uh, to try to get it where they can have some access to the hose clamps once the engine is installed because sometimes you may just have to come in after 100 hours or maybe 500 hours a thousand hours whatever and these hose clamps might need, because the, the rubber's compressing, they might need just a little bit of a turn. But if you can't get to them because the overhauler positioned them conveniently for them and not for the aircraft, uh, you're really gonna, you're gonna make someone's life miserable. So what we try to do is we try to think, okay, where are the intake pipes? Where is the exhaust system? Is this something, where's the alternator? Where's the starter? Is this something that can be accessed um, maybe not easily but at least with a quarter inch drive an extension maybe a u-joint or just a nut driver to allow a mechanic in the field to come in here and get these things snugged up a little bit if not then you're going to cause someone else a lot of maintenance hassle having to disassemble parts of the engine so they can come back to these little tubes just to give them a, a little tweak or so or to replace them. Even if you have to replace them out in the field, you're not gonna make anyone's life pleasant. So that's what we're doing here, is we're just making sure that the uh, tubes are, uh, most importantly, the correct tubes. 
there's a with the with the, the positioning of the engine and all that and the geometry of the engine uh, these tubes are different the intake tubes are different so you just got to make sure you have the correct one on the correct cylinder uh, check the parts manual and of course check the fitment uh, as you're uh, assembling the engine so we're uh, tightening these up and then we're tightening the, the cylinder side up and then we'll come back and tighten up the Jubilee clamps or the hose clamps on the lower end and we're putting a torx in on there. What we did here is uh, tighten it till it snugs and then one flat. That's kind of an industry standard thing and uh, on the B-nuts and then we're, uh, you can see we're tightening these so you can access, access them, access, that's a hard word to say, access the clamps from the front of the engine. So we're assuming the engine has a uh, has the induction system on it, it's got the exhaust system on it. The other thing is on this side of the engine, well, maybe maybe on both sides of the engine, this is above the sump, so it's kind of in a little corner. It's above the sump in front of the engine mount, so it's in a little bit of a pocket. They're a little bit difficult to get to. On your six-cylinder engines, they'd be a little easier, but on these, they are a little more difficult to get to. So we're gonna try to have some pity on the folks that are going to be operating this engine and uh, keep, keeping an eye out for leaks. On a Lycoming engine, there's no reason why the engine should not run absolutely perfectly leak-free. Uh, they're not drippy engines, they're not leaky engines, but if you have cylinder base leaks or drain back tube leaks or even intake tube where they go into the sump leaks, those all need to be addressed. These are very nice engines, there's no reason why they should have any leaks. Push rods are up on top of the engine. Typically you have very few leaks at all on those. Oil screen, even though this engine has an oil filter, there's a last chance screen at the suction screen. It goes on the very bottom of the engine and that will, uh, that goes in. Very simple on that one, just a little oil on the threads. Another AN900 copper gasket and then in it goes. So. That's uh, and what we're trying to do here, especially prior to shipping. Anytime we ship an engine, we want every opening closed as much as we can. We don't want to have any open areas that during the shipment process, whether it's an owner picking it up in their vehicle or commercial freight, we don't want to have the ability for anything to blow in, any kind of opening and all that. So what we're doing now, this is kind of, as I said, the final episode, we're, we're closing closing things up. The core engine itself, the machinery, is essentially done. So now we are just doing the final assembly and closing up. So just uh, one of the many things. This screen is probably going to be the first thing that gets pulled 25 hours after, uh, probably 25 hours after the engine is uh, overhauled, or pardon me, is test run. So we're going to, that'll be, uh, that'll be checked on, uh, on, uh, final run or first run post first run as the engine is broken in so we don't expect to see anything in there but should anything bad happen that's where it's going to be caught first as far as safety wiring goes you'll see a lot of folks that they cannot safety wire without a pair of safety wire pliers uh, i would say that a good third of my safety wiring is done without a pair of safety wire pliers most of the time that's because of access but if you require safety wire pliers to do a good safety wire job, you really need to look at it. It's not that hard to do. You should be able to do it with just a pair of simple pliers. Most importantly, especially for any of you owner operators, it doesn't have to be perfect. Don't get hung up on that. In our mechanic schools, a lot of the instructors will like to just harp on the fact that safety wire has to be perfect. Safety wire is not holding the aircraft together. Its whole purpose is to retain the part until you find the problem, and then you can hopefully fix the problem, but the safety wire retain the part. Uh, in the case of a lot of engine parts, we want to make sure that the part does not get ingested into the induction system. So real important, most importantly, is safety wire. If it requires safety, you're out in a, a faraway land, and you're not very good at safety wiring, do the best you can. When you get back to civilization, have your mechanic or your shop come look at it, replace it if necessary, and double check. 
intake tubes pretty similar to the oil drain back tubes you know they only fit one place there's different sizes no big deal we put this in with all new lock washers and washers new gasketing and all that you can see on this engine we painted the retaining rings pretty matching pink or blue so made that made that uh, all set up and then what we're going to do here is we're going to get that flange and this is actually kind of you got to keep an eye out is make sure your gasket does not drop down when your engine is on an engine stand uh, I'm guilty of it I, I've had that happen where I had to go back and fix it but get your bolts started on your flange and then get your hose set up and then what I'm doing here is I'm pulling that hose to the engine and I'll probably have to noodle it a little bit more and then we'll snug up the bolts So we're getting those going. The tubes themselves are a steel tube. We had those replated when we sent the rest of our hardware out, so they look kind of trick. They kind of match the uh, plating on the valve cover, so that's uh, it's going to be. It's just a, a very good-looking engine, so it looks looks pretty sharp. Totally a mechanical. It's a nothing more than a mechanical coating. It has nothing to do with cosmetics. If you are getting any CAD plating done, there is variability in it. As you can see, between those two products there, there is a variability of shading, and that's that's okay. It's not uh, not anything that you really control. You're not doing plating for cosmetics as far as cadmium plating. Chrome plating, sure, but not cadmium plating. It's purely a mechanical corrosion protective. And here now, I kind of switch up on my... Uh, sockets and now still as uh, since I, I tightened up that flange making sure that that rubber connector hose is down and then we'll tighten up those jubilee clamps and make them nice and snug now you can see i'm orienting these so that i can as as the oil drain back tubes are kind of up in a shelf area we aim those where you can access them from the forward area because we're assuming that's better access, there's less to do, there's no engine mount, things of that nature. On these, we're orienting them to the bottom. So we're getting those set. Now, there's nothing hard and fast where they have to be. So if you are if you are installing an engine for your aircraft that just came back from the shop and they seem to be in a place that is uh, gonna be hard to get to, there's no problem reorienting these kind of hose clamps so that you can get access once you get into the engine installation of your aircraft. Uh, the overhaul shop doesn't really know where your all your various components are on your installation, so they're going to put it where they typically put them. You know, and that's pretty much what I'm doing is I'm uh, setting up for a typical installation or typical access. If this was on a Cessna or a Piper Beechcraft, that's I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, pretty darn sure you can access these items from the bottom of the area, bottom of the engine, down by the carburetor and things of that nature. And getting our gasket on, making sure we don't forget the gasket. Bolts kind of, the bolts kind of, or the gasket kind of holds the bolts on, which is kind of handy. And then we'll just get those started, get those going. And as I said, we I want to get the flange secured first, make sure it's centered, the gasket centered, and get that down before I slide the tube on. I want to make sure that that's set. And then here I am pulling the tube on. Now I'll end up doing a more, little more gorilla pulling on that later. You'll see me kind of jump on the engine. Well, actually, not jump on the engine, but pull on that. But we want to get the uh, I want to get that flange snug down first, then we'll bring the clamps back, get the hose in position. Something else that is may crop up during your initial installation, and when I say initial installation, the first 50 hours of flight, you may actually have to come back and snug the rubber hose clamps. Uh, they might require just a little bit of a snug as the clamps take a set in the rubber. So that's something you want to do in your post flights. Uh, post overhaul flights, post installation runs and all that is take a look at all the clamping, make sure everything's snug, make sure everything is where it should be. And it's still hot out. This is, uh, at the time, this was about, uh, uh, about 100 degrees, 110 degrees out down here in good old Texas. So 
this is the last of our summer series and here I am trying to get the uh, trying to get that hose up and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just pushing the hose up to the sump um, and getting it set up so I want to make sure it's in exactly the proper place so that's what's going on there get that all get that where it needs to be and we put it on dry we didn't put any lube on it so it's uh it's just a little bit a little bit ornery getting in position now that being said it's not going to slide off that's for sure we want to make sure it's just exactly where it needs to be and then we just snug up the clamps and go so what we're doing here is we're just doing one side of the engine just like we did on the drain back tubes other side exactly the same thing just more of the same so that's what's going on there and we'll come back we'll actually come back and torque these clamps uh, there is a spec called out in the overhaul manual so we'll double check that make sure that's good and get those all set up and believe it or not there's a way to safety those clamps on some uh, not these clamps but uh, there's similar clamps on uh, engine preheaters and there's actually a procedure to safety those to keep those make sure those are snug so that's pretty well it for the intake tubes okay that's about it for this episode and for this engine we well, got the intake tubes on we got the hinder cylinder baffles in we've got the oil drain tubes in now I've just got to go around and double check all the torques on some of these uh, items and uh, close a bunch of stuff out. Got a few covers on the back to put on. But short of that, we're about done on this engine. Thanks to all you folks watching. We really do appreciate it. And um, pardon, the, uh, pardon the things blowing around in the shop here. We've got the doors open. Um, please like, share, subscribe, notify, all that good stuff. And we'll see you on the next episode. Hanging Rats out.